This is the painting by the great uh, Renaissance painter Fra Angelico, um, who lived um, from nine, or 1395 to 1455. So he is an early transition painter into uh, the Renaissance. And things were just beginning to come together um, as Fra Angelico was painting. Let me tell you a little bit about him before we get started, and then we'll move into the text. Fra Angelica was a Dominican monk. He actually was the prior of San Marco um, Monastery in uh, Milan, or in Florence. And his uh, patron was Cosimo de' Medici, who was the leader of one of the most powerful families in Italy, and also one of the richest men of his generation. Um, Fra Angelica, that was not his actual uh, name. He was born Guido de Pietro, um, but he was named uh, by his contemporaries, even at the beginning, An Angelico, which means angel or messenger. And the Fra is simply the title for a Dominican monk. Um, he is also the only painter who has been beatified by the Pope. He was beatified by Pope John Paul in uh, 1982 and was made the patron of the arts um, by the Pope in 1984. At some point, Fra Angelico may even be um, fainted. So he is an amazing person uh, to begin to take a look at, uh, an amazing example of um, an incredibly talented man. Um, dedicating his talents uh, to the service of God. So let's, as we uh, move on, uh, we'll get into this. Let's get into the text. Now, over the summer, I took a class from a man named John Walsh online from the Yale Art Gallery in um, New Haven, Connecticut. And John Walsh is the retired uh, emeritus director of the Getty uh, Museum down in LA. He actually built the new museum while he was there. He was teaching a class on the history paintings. And since I've always been intimidated by them, I thought I'd spend 12 hours uh, studying with John Walsh and learn how to take them apart and hopefully how to present them. So uh, John Walsh always, just to pattern myself a bit on what this uh, great art historian did, um, he always introduced us to the painting and a bit to the artist. And then he looked at the text closely, very closely, far more closely than I thought he would at the text that the painting was, was based on. What was the story this artist was trying to present in two dimensions and in a much more um, condensed space than what we would have in a narrative story that you would read? So let's begin uh, with the text from Luke. And how many of you know what happened right before this? This is the Annunciation to Mary. And there's an Annunciation just prior to this in the temple in Jerusalem to a, um, he was a Levite uh, called Zechariah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that has just preceded this. And Zechariah's wife is Elizabeth, and she's uh, been infertile the whole time of their marriage, and she's older. So um, the Annunciation to Zechariah is the promise of this long-awaited, uh, longed-for child. And it's uh, more than a bit of a miracle baby for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah is the cousin of Mary, who is the um, protagonist, if you might say, in this second Annunciation scene in Luke. And these are really parallel stories if we have time to look at all of them. So in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Well, let's unpack this first verse just a little bit. It's the sixth month of what? Well, it's not the sixth month of the year. It's not like we're in June. We are in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Mm. Okay. 
So Luke, as a gospel writer, is always particular to give us a time and a place. And so it's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and we're in a place called Nazareth, in really a backwater of this kingdom of Israel, uh, which is a backwater of the empire, because at this point in time, this is part of the Roman Empire. Now, this is the virgin, so it's a young girl who's engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. What does it mean? This is a very important part of this particular text because all through the Old Testament, God has been promising, making promises to people that he would raise up a son of the house of David who would reign forever. And so this is the announcement. This child has a lineage going back to David. And Luke will scope that out for us in detail in uh, Luke um, 3.23, if you actually want to read the genealogy. And there's another one in Matthew. It's extraordinarily important that this goes back to David. And for those of you who were here last week when we did the class on judges, uh, judges was written to uh, point toward the necessity for the um, the monarchy and especially for the Davidic monarchy. And the editor in charge of that was a man named the Deuter Deuteronomist historian. And those um, there's a whole series of history books in the Bible that are shaped between Deuteronomy and Second Kings um, by these editors who were working to um, point towards uh, the, the need for the Davidic um, monarchy. Okay, and then if you remember the story that we will read here on Christmas Eve, most likely, um, Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, a city of David called Beth Bethlehem. What's the next line? because he was descended from the house of David. This continues. So we're setting the stage for the birth of this child. And then he comes to her and said, greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. So there's a greeting and she's favored, um, but she is much perplexed. So there's some doubt and some wonderment here, you might say. How would you feel if you met an angel of the Lord? <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit. Uh, it's also important not only that Joseph was of the house of David, but also that uh, Mary is a virgin, a young girl. In Isaiah 7, 14, we read, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. So look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and you shall name him Emmanuel. Over and over again, these two things are part of the promise. Okay. So, you know, we didn't, or at least I didn't grow up Catholic. I grew up very, very Lutheran, but I did grow up in a very, very um, Italian Catholic um, neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York. And I square, although that's not a nice thing to do in church, but uh, <laughs> there was a Virgin Mary um, in the front lawn of every house that I walked by. <laughs> on so in this um, heavily Sicilian uh, community, which was a mob-dominated uh, Sicilian community, by the way, um, um, there was quite the devotion to Mary. We don't have that same kind of devotion in the Lutheran church. And one of the sort of reappraisals of the role of Mary has been happening in the 20th century to take a look at Mary, not necessarily as sort of this junior member of the Godhead, which is where sort of Catholic theology has placed her with the, um, the encyclical um, in the 19th century, um, but rather to consider her to be um, an example of a very faithful Christian. And also, as we look at uh, this text from, from Luke, and actually that we just finished up with the, with the year of Luke, so they won't be preaching on this. 
Um, but Mary is over and over considered to be a devout and faithful Jew. So this is uh, the mother of Jesus. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay. And then do we have a reader here or Amy, can I get you to do you want to use this mic? Okay. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And Sorry. now you oh, yeah, yes, okay. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Okay, well, if you ever want to get a sense of how angels are introduced almost all the time in the Bible, you almost always get the line, do not be afraid. This is a repeated refrain over and over again. Do not be afraid in the presence of the messenger of God. And um, now, then there comes what the promise. And the angel has come with a message. Um, the angel is simply a transliteration of the Greek angelos, which means messenger. So an angel is bringing a message. And the message is, you will conceive and bear a son. And you will name him Jesus. Now, what do we know about the name Jesus other than sort of that he died on a cross for our sins? Well, Jesus is a common form of the name Joshua. Now, does anyone remember from your Sunday school lessons who Joshua was? Yes. Okay, very good, John Bailey. They had good Sunday school in Mason City, Iowa. <laughs> Do you want to repeat for online? Okay, so Joshua was the right-hand man for Moses. And um, at that time when uh, the Israelites were to make this transition from wandering in the wilderness to moving into uh, the land of Canaan, the promised land, Moses was not allowed to do that. Moses died. And then Joshua took over as the leader of the people and brought them into the land of Canaan. So if you read the book of Joshua, which follows the book of uh, Deuteronomy, um, this is part of the story that you'll learn about. So Jesus shares a name with Joshua, who brought the people into the land of of Judah into the land of Canaan. Okay, now oh, I'm on the wrong page. No. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. These are what we call titles for who Jesus is. I had really hoped to open today with um, handles of um, the chorale from the Messiah, for unto us a child is is born, um, and then you get this wonderful, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Ruler, the Prince of Peace. Those are all titles taken directly from the book of Isaiah. And here we have a foreshortened version of that. We get some titles for who uh, Jesus is, or is going to be. The angel is unpacking this for Mary um, at this point in the story. So he will be the son of the most high, which is a quote from uh, the Old Testament. And the Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. Okay, so right smack again, we're getting woken up. Um, it's very important that he's a son of the uh, Davidic line. Okay. And those passages were, this is quoted from our Psalm 2-7, uh, which is a um, a psalm used during coronations of king, and also in 2 Samuel 7 and in Daniel 14. So we move through the histories and into the prophecy. So let's move on to the next one. 
we got a few questions about the reality of this. Um, she may be a virgin, but she's not a naive girl. Um, she knows a thing or two about how things happen. So the Holy Spirit is part of this whole thing. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the overshadowing um, was there was something we talked about at the end of our uh, class last week uh, when we looked at the Tintoretto and we talked about the rays coming down and God being um, sort of overshadowing this scene of the Annunciation. Um, if you think about um, the Transfiguration, um, later this year we'll celebrate Transfiguration Sunday and on Transfiguration Sunday, Jesus goes up to a mountaintop with the disciples and what happens? Mm. God speaks out of the cloud. God overshadows. They're overshadowed. Um, this happens uh, repeatedly uh, to the prophet Moses as they are wandering around in the wilderness. This is a pattern as to how God is present. And uh, for nothing will be impossible with God. Well, we get the sign here because the angel tells Mary that her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. This is the sign that this is going to happen. Mary knows full well that Elizabeth hasn't been able to have a baby. Um, and that um, for nothing will be impossible for God. And then Mary says, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And that's almost a direct quote um, from Hannah's response to God um, during the Annunciation of the birth of Samuel. So when you read these texts, or when you listen to these texts, remember that they're echoing something, and that as you get into them and take them apart and look at them, they become wonderfully more interesting and powerful. So now let's start looking at this. And this is the picture we looked at last week. And there was something that I neglected to point out or uh, share with you last week. And I'd like to do that this week because it's so critical to um, Renaissance painting. And that is atmospheric perspective. So if you look here at the painting where the sky breaks in, Mm -hmm. And you look at the color, not only of the sky, but also of the mountains behind that. What happens as you recede, your eye recedes into the background of this painting? What about the colors? It becomes lighter, very, very good. There's usually a, a coloring of white at the top. You move, colors lose their power as they get further away. And that was a way to give dimensionality to art. And that became to be um, used in, um, in paintings at, during the Renaissance. Instead of it being a flat space behind them, they added perspective and roundness to figures um, in a number of ways. And one of the ways that they added perspective was with atmospheric uh, perspective. Today, we're going to be uh, looking at another way that they added uh, perspective and three-dimensionality to a uh, two-dimensional portrait or a picture. So let's move on to the next. You've all caught on to atmospheric perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good, you're smart. <laughs> okay. Let's take a look at this one. This is a painting or a fresco by Leonardo da Vinci of the Last Supper. And what I want to point out now is the vanishing point or linear perspective. So as you look back and all of this, all the mathematical principles for this were developed by a, a Florentine architect by the name of uh, Filippo Brunicelli. Um, who had uh, figured out how to complete the dome of the great church in Florence, which is the largest dome in the world. And he also developed the theory behind linear perspective. 
So if you look back here, what's happening as you go across the top, look at the wood paneling in the back. It's wider in the front and it gets narrower, built like a swimmer's bottom, right? Okay. And what also happens to the arches in the doorways? They recede going back. Have you ever stood and looked at a train track? And you know that if you keep your gaze way out there, eventually those two tracks are going to meet. Okay. That's what's happening here. Now, we can point out really briefly how Leonardo da Vinci has used that uh, to great benefit to point out the leading character, mm -hmm. essentially the protagonist of the, of the picture here, um, is, is Jesus, of course, and all the lines converge on him, and behind him is what we would call the vanishing point, where all the lines would come together. This kind of linear perspective is going to be part of what we'll talk about as we move into looking at our picture today by um, Fra Angelica. Because he was actually a contemporary of Vernicelli. So his art was heavily influenced by this new development. They're both working in the same town and they both have the same patron, uh, Cosimo de' Medici. Cosimo de' Medici, um, if you watch the Netflix series on uh, the Medici, uh, was really the guy who started the Medici Bank, and he gave six thousand floor, six hundred thousand florins, um, something in the range of five hundred million dollars, um, to uh, um, to the arts in Florence, and um, greatly transformed the city. So um, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. So what are we seeing here? You guys get to talk and give me a break on my voice. <laughs> There's the angel. Yeah. Okay. And who else do we have? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, this is one of the brilliant, one of the wonderful parts of this painting, um, because um, Fra Angelico has included the entire story of creation through salvation in his portrayal. So in this single frame, we get a very, very rich uh, painting. Okay, this painting is essentially divided up into three parts. Do you see that? There's yeah. this niche, essentially, there's the angel's niche, and there's Mary's niche, mm -hmm. okay? And who do we have over here walking out of the garden, driven by an angel? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this angel up here is actually the same angel as down here. They're dressed exactly the same. But we get a repeat of the angel in two different stories in two entirely different frameworks. But he's telling the whole story because of our sin and disobedience. Mm -hmm. God um, sends salvation in the form of his son. So just to unpack some of the symbolism here because the garden's a very, very rich element. So let's start on the left side. Um, here we have Adam and Eve, and if you take a look at her hands, it appears that she's praying. And Adam looks like, what the heck have I gotten myself in? How did I, how did I mess up so bad that I got, you know, lost my free lunch? And they're walking out clothed, so it's after the disobedience. Okay, so in the center here, there's a palm tree. And a palm tree is a symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So that's um, highly symbolic. The red roses here are a symbol of Mary. Okay. They're walking out of essentially what is a closed garden because there's no re-entry once you've gotten kicked out. And um, that's called in our terms of hortus conclusus. And that's also symbolic of Mary's virginity. So all of those symbols 
are portrayed in the left side of the painting. What's above um, the angel Gabriel fluttering in the sky over there in the garden? Well, the sun, and if you look really, really closely, and I'm not sure you can see it at a distance, but there are two hands there from which the light is emanating. Uh, oh, there's something white. See. Yeah, it is hard to see here, um, but it is. Um, let's just pretend for an instant that you can see it. <laughs> And that it um, could be ID'd by you as the hands of God. <laughs> okay. The hands of God the Father. Mm -hmm. So the sun is also our light source here. Mm -hmm. So we have light streaming from the left side to the right side of the painting in a downward arc. And what do we have floating here? Uh, we have the dove, which is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have the directionality going directly at, um, at Mary. Mm -hmm. What else do you notice about these two people? What would happen in, in that space if they stood up, stood up straight? <laughs> I think, yeah, uh, Fra Angelico is really playing with our perceptions here mm -hmm. because despite the beauty of the blue arches with the gold stars in them, um, done in ultramarine paint, which is so expensive, um, decorated with gold gilt, it's not, they're not, it's not in proportion to their size. It's an enclosed type of space. It's a womb-like type of space, you might say. Okay. And so Mary is seated. Once again, she's wearing a blue robe, very expensive color. And she's sitting on a gold cloth. Okay, now, I know we did not grow up Catholic, but I'm not gonna ask you to use, put on your imagination hats. And think about the phrase ex cathedra. Do you have, any of you have any idea what that means? Okay, well, in a cathedral, a cathedral is a cathedral because the bishop sits there. And at the front of every cathedral, there's a chair where the bishop sits to teach, to instruct. And Mary is given that pose here, that posture uh, by the artist. And that's typical of how Mary is um, portrayed. And in this particular situation, this is a pretty spectacular gold cloth. Frangelica did at least five um, depictions of the Annunciation. And depending on how quickly I get through this, I don't think we'll make it through all of them, but um, it's interesting to note the differences between what how he's presented the story. This particular Annunciation uh, was done as a, um, as an altarpiece in one of the side chapels of a church. And so this was meant for the laity and the Annunciation scenes that Frangelica did for uh, the monastery where he was prior because Cosimo de' Medici um, commissioned him to decorate the place. Um, those are much simpler in conception and more for devotional use, you might say. And um, this was also part of um, a much larger altarpiece. So there were six scenes of the life of Mary underneath it. And if, we'll try to make some time and get through to see that. So let's, um, and well, let's go to where's the vanishing point here? Because this is also one of the major things that Frangelico plays with in his depictions of the Annunciation is where's, yeah. So you can see where this is coming together. There's sort of a, a vanishing point there, but you hit a wall. Mm -hmm. But if you come over here, you hit a window. So all the arches move backwards to the vanishing point in the room, the Virgin's chamber, and the vanishing point in that picture would be in that window. What is 
And they talk about the vanishing point or a window in a painting as always being a way to escape the painting. So uh, you can escape this painting if you can get your hips are narrow enough to get it. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. Who is Pictures on above that middle column. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and oh well, let's talk about the middle column. I've heard or I've read a wide variety of commentaries on that. It's pretty hard to know for sure. Some people are saying it's God the Father. In other portrayals of the Annunciation, people are uh, saying that um, Fra Angelica has a uh, portrait. For, done a portrait or a half portrait of the prophet Isaiah, who was um, significant in prophesying uh, about the birth of the Messiah. Many, many passages uh, come from Isaiah on that score. Mm -hmm. And then this is a swallow. So we have the dove, which is a symbol of the, of the Holy Spirit. So we have Father, Son, and the light somewhere, and um, the Holy Spirit. But the swallow up there is also a symbol of Christ. The white is uh, the purity and the black is um, the pain and suffering on the cross. Mm. So that all these paintings are heavily symbolic. And because we don't know all these symbols just right off the top of the head like we would uh, watching The Simpsons or something like that. <laughs> um, we have to work a little bit harder at it. Okay, let's move on. Oh, okay, so here you get a close up of Adam and Eve and the palm tree. And I, I think I can't decide if that's a pear tree or just what behind there, but um, there's all sorts of flowers there. Is Eve looking at the viewer of the painting? Well, she could very well be because her eyes are gazing right out at us. Oh, yeah. She looks to me like she's looking, giving him dirty looks. <laughs> I, you could be right. That would be a hard place to be in that manner. He looks like he did. Uh, yeah, well, mm. um, yeah. it was a whole new adventure actually <laughs> growing your own food. Let's move on to the yeah. next one. Okay, so if you actually can see and take a look at this, and I, I haven't read anything about this, but it did sort of occur to me that in this tiara essentially around her head, that those look a lot like daisies to me. I don't know, do they look like daisies to you or am I stretching this? No, no, they have Okay, well, daisies are also a flower that's a symbol of the Virgin Mary. So you get a chance to see her beautiful halo and take admire the daisies in her tiara or the ribbon around the hair. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, now this is another um, if we okay. Do you remember the way I go back up a second here to um, the slide that had the next one, next one. Okay. Now when you go up to church the next time, I would very much like you to look at the columns in the church because there are uh, the columns of stairs are ionic columns. They have the little scrolls at the top. The difference between those columns and these columns are the acanthus leaves on there. And these are Corinthian columns, okay? So if you'll note the shape of the arches, the type of columns, okay? Fra Angelica was working with the architecture that was he was looking at all the time. Okay, so if we move back to that other slide. Okay, this is Nicolazzo, who is also a contemporary of um, Fra Angelico's and who was commissioned by Cosimo de Medici, the name keeps coming up, uh, to build both um, San Marco Monastery 
uh, where Fra Angelica was prior, and also the Palazzo de' Medici, uh, which is uh, now a, a great art museum. So if you look at the way the arches are shaped, and if you get up close, um, or if you happen to go to Florence to take a look, <laughs> you'll be able to see the way the arches, arches are shaped. They don't have the beautiful blue interior that we see in Fra Angelico's painting, so he's added that detail. But he's working with um, what he's looking at, which is pretty beautiful in my humble opinion. Okay, let's move on. Okay, here's the predella. Here you see the whole altarpiece. Okay, and this is uh, the birth and the betrothal of Mary. Um, this is the visitation. If you, I mean, this is very small. It's hard to see even on a computer screen. Uh, this is Mary and Elizabeth greeting each other. Um, this is the adoration of the Magi. Remember the, the gifts, um, which is actually a scene from Matthew. And this is the presentation at the temple, which is a scene from Luke. And then this is a dormition, which is uh, not in the canonical Bibles, um, but is uh, very much part of the story of Mary and also um, how she was portrayed at this time in these strongly Catholic areas. So, do you have any questions? For those who don't know, what is the dormition? The dormition is, uh, uh, it means to, dormira means to go to sleep in Latin. So it's the death of Mary. Mm -hmm. Okay. But she doesn't die, she just falls. <laughs> right. Yes. And then she's enthroned in heaven. So thank you for that important question. <laughs> yeah. So you see the whole um, the whole story. And one of the things to remember is, is that not everyone was literate at this time. <laughs> so the way to instruct the laity, largely the laity, because Fra Angelica was literate, he was also a copyist and a miniaturist and, um, in terms of doing Bible. Um, but the way that they instructed was through uh, paintings, through stained glass windows, um, through music. This was how people learned the stories. And the stories are fundamental to the thing. Okay, let's. Okay. Yeah, many times these have been broken up. So it's uh, very fortunate um, that this painting's in the Prado in Madrid and it's all together. So this is Filippo uh, Brunicelli, uh, the great architect. And uh, this cathedral had been had a hole in its ceiling for more than a hundred years. And it's the biggest dome on earth. And the only person or the first person who figured out how to fill it all in successfully was uh, Filippo Brunicelli. Um, and I signed it. You have? Yes, I have. How long did it take you? Uh, I didn't time it, but it, it gets... <laughs> you see the whole city. Uh, it, would be, it, would be, it would be marvelous, yeah. Well, let's move on to the next one. It's on my bucket list. This is Cosimo de' Medici, um, just so you get a sense of what he looked like. Um, he's quite the profile, you might say, <laughs> and quite the bank book as well. And uh, this is David uh, by Donatello. This is the first new um, sculpture in a thousand years in uh, Europe. And it was commissioned by Cosimo de' Medici and then by the great sculptor uh, Donatello. And there was a copy of the, um, Sorry. oh, it's okay, of Michelangelo David in the a Metropolitan Museum in the entryway when I was a child. Okay. Yeah. And this is Fra Angelica, Angelico. And um, <clears throat> he was a Dominican monk. Um, the Dominican order had been founded by Saint Dominic. 
And there are several other um, very influential and um, theologians um, who were also Dominicans, uh, one of the greatest of which was St. Thomas Aquinas, was a member of the Dominican order. Uh, Martin Bucer, who uh, left the order and uh, became a Lutheran at the time of the Reformation, was a great ally of Martin Luther's, was also a Dominican monk. It's a teaching order, and they have been mendicants, which means they sort of wandered around um, seeking alms or gifts. Um, but they eventually got settled down. It's a great teaching order. Um, they have many educational um, institutions around. Um, so let's... Um, it's interesting that all these people we're looking at have dark hair and all the paintings have blonde. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at the next one. Okay, this is um, our painting again, just to refresh our mind. Let's keep going. Okay, now this is another enunciation by Frangelico. And uh, do you notice any differences? What are you seeing? Well, they are back here. They're, yeah, they're much smaller. So it pays to be close, you know, it's hard to see from the back there, um, but they are there. Yeah, the wings are slightly different, but the dress is the same in terms of the embroidery for the angel. Um, it's simpler in some ways. Yeah, there was no daisies in her hair today. Um, this is a simpler rendition. I think the, the one we saw today earlier was the one at the Prado is the most um, ornate of any of the um, enunciations that from that Angelica did. Um, this is San Giovanni Valdarno. And where is the vanishing point? In the window. Very, very good. Yeah. So once again, it's inside. Now let's take a look at the next one. Oh, and that was Isaiah up here at the top. Okay. So here, where is the vanishing point? This is the Annunciation at Portona. At Adam and Eve. At Adam and Eve. Okay, do you see how these pillars line up? So the vanishing point drawing attention to the initial disobedience is on the left. And then the scene is portrayed once again in a tripartite manner. Um, and yeah, there's another difference here. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, what you said earlier, uh, you're right, that those artists all have dark hair, and yet white. I mean, these are like very light hair and very white skin. Did they, what is that? Why, how come they didn't paint them? If they painted other things like he was used to the, the arches and the columns and all that, why wouldn't he paint them to look like? Well, this is Florence, and there are more blondes in Northern Europe, Northern mm -hmm. Italy, than there are in the South. This is not Sicily. We're up in Tuscany in the North. So that's more common um, to actually see that kind of, those types of people. And um, as my husband points out, um, on numerous occasions, the Vikings made quite the tour. <laughs> of Europe and uh, scattered quite a lot of blonde genes. Um, yeah, um, pretty much everywhere. But it is it is different. And part of it could be that, um, you know, with the blonde hair, they did, did that in gold. That's all done in, in gold leaf, which is a more precious type of paint. So it's a way of really bringing home what a holy and um, important scene this is that they've lavished so much of these expensive pigments on it. You can shade it, but more easily too than the 
Sorry. Yeah, that's yeah, that's also true. Okay, I also want to point out we talked about ultramarine, but the paint color here is a color called vermilion, and it was made with a cinnabar seed. Um, so this was also an incredibly expensive pigment. So in this theme, we have the red or the vermilion paint, which is very expensive and difficult to mix properly. We have the ultramarine, which is also extraordinarily expensive and difficult to mix. And we have the gold leaf. All of this really announces to uh, people who are coming um, how important this scene is uh, for them to contemplate. And once again, it's part of a predella with the scenes of Mary's life at the bottom. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah, what, Gabrielle? Oh, oh. Above, oh. above Mary's head up by the ceiling. Is that a little shadow? Yeah. Oh, this up here, this this is the dove. Oh, okay. This is Isaiah with a scroll. Okay, yeah. So the sprout is just really to stand up and see. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit less uh, difficult than getting stuck in a Bilbo's house in one of those movies. I, I don't know if you've all seen that when the wizard comes and he has to be in that very, very small, short space. Okay, this is a fresco, and this was done in one of the halls as you came up to the top of the stair. I think on your way to the refectory. So the monks would see this all the time. Um, it's on your way in to eat. And this is also an Annunciation. This is at San Marco. It's still there. Note what's different here. Different share. That's very critical um, importance. Very colorful wings. There's more color in these wings um, with the orange and the red and the light pink. It's very, very pretty. Her gown is dark. Yeah, her gown is dark, and whether or not the ultramarine has um, has faded, because if it wasn't mixed properly, it faded out. Um, that I'm not sure. Um, I just see I, the two figures. No yeah. Adam Eve, no dove, no garden. Right. Yeah. It's well, the garden here, I think, is behind this picket fence. Um, so that's looks very much like a backyard in Sacramento. Yeah. Um, what okay? So, this, um, the chair, the stool that she had pointed that, um, a gentleman pointed out earlier, this is very much more the way the monks would live. Okay, so this is done for a group of religious people in a simpler setting and done in a way that they um, can take in. So let's look at the last one. And this is a fresco also from San Marco, and this is in one of the cells. Um, one of the rooms, they call them cells, where, they, uh, where the monks live. So that each of those had frescoes by um, Fra Angelico. Mm -hmm. And this was the fresco that a particular monk was given to contemplate um, for his prayers, his devotional life, um, to increase his faith, um, to help him grow in grace and obedience to God. So um, if you take a look at your um at the sheet that has the are there any extra sheets up there on the table yeah um, okay. okay just in closing because i know everyone needs and wants to get up to church on time um or off to your brunch reservation we know which of those is more important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yeah. For the most of will have to wait. <laughs> okay, if you look at the bottom, Fra Angelica died in Rome. Um, he'd been uh, summoned by the Pope uh, to decorate a convent. Um, and those frescoes do not survive. And he's buried at uh, Santa Maria, uh, so from the Arab. Um, 
which is an interesting name because Minerva was a Greek goddess, but the epitaph I just think is so beautiful. When singing my praise, don't liken my talents to those of Apelles. Say rather that in the name of Christ, I gave all I had to the poor. The deeds that, I, that count on earth are not the ones that count in heaven. I, Giovanni, am the flower of Tuscany. <laughs> Can I just say, um, I'm yeah, really Pastor delighted Frank. that Pastor Jenna Carlson, and, and she's not operated under that title for a long time um, because she's been doing other things, but uh, to get her theological prowess and merged with her interest and expertise in art has been a benefit for us, wouldn't you say? A good people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we maybe could convince her to do a little more of this from time to time. Yeah. Would that be good? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. I think that goes back to Rebecca. Yes. Um, so I thought we'd close with his epitaph, um, which is a beautiful way to close. And I hope you've had a wonderful introduction now to the Advent season. Today is the first Sunday. My husband um, thoughtfully wore blue and <laughs> Blue is, of course, the color of Advent, either blue or violet. Um, it would be rose on the third Sunday of Advent uh, when we lighten up a bit for that third Sunday in our preparation for the coming Christmas. Um, so um, thank you all for coming, and I look forward to whatever we're able to do in the future. Thanks, Janet. Thank you.